Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. As always, as usual, as per standard, check this out. A little while back, we put out a video basically that said cheating is a bad idea when it comes to exercise technique. And it was very well received. A lot of people agree with it. And some folks had a few follow-up questions, sort of to the tune of like, well, hold on a second. You didn't cover X, Y, and Z other reasons. Totally hear you. We do read the comments. So here are a few responses and considerations of some of the awesome, excellent points you guys brought up to try to give a bit more nuance to this discussion of are cheat reps a good idea or are they a bad idea? Here are some more reasons not to cheat. We'll get into the details. Here we go. So a few folks brought up the following and here basically it is. Can you cheat on the concentric, really oomph it up, for example, on the curl, to ride out the eccentric of a load or rep you couldn't lift with a concentric. There's a scientific term in literature for this. It is uh, abbreviated EAL, eccentric accentuated loading. It is essentially doing more load on the eccentric phase, on the lowering part, than you would on the concentric phase. There's a bunch of different ways to do this. There's some customized machines in which the concentric is actually programmed lower than the eccentric. These are really cool, pretty rare. Some of them are kind of clunky, but you can sort of ghetto do this if you just swing the curl on the way up, get the concentric with a weight you probably couldn't for whatever reps you were trying, and then milk the eccentric. Is this a good idea? Well, so what are the benefits? Here's the deal. Eccentric accentuated loading has been studied pretty decent amount in strength, in performance sport, and a little bit in hypertrophy. And the literature just isn't clear about its benefits. That's not to say it doesn't have them, but there's not a compelling body of evidence that says, hey, for sure, eccentric accentuated loading is this awesome thing that definitely boosts hypertrophy more than just doing standard reps, right? That body of literature, as far as I can tell, the current time making this video, doesn't exist. Now, because you have to swing the weight up and because you have to ride out eccentrically a weight that's really, really heavy and very hard to lift, the stimulus can be pretty high, but the fatigue is also going to be high for that. So the stimulus to fatigue ratio is likely not as good beyond concentric failure, which is to say with uh, eccentric accentuated loading, as it is with just conventional training. In addition to that, some pretty decent animal data where they got mice doing the weights. It's actually brutal how they do it. They like put the mouse into like sort of like a, a squat machine contraption and they electroshock the motherfucker if he dips below a certain point. So he just keeps doing this. Terrible what they do to those mice, but they benefit from getting jacked, which is kind of cool. So animal data shows uh, that some slight different pathways for hypertrophy are activated by isometric contractions, concentric contractions, and eccentric contractions. To some extent, there's tons of overlap, but to some extent, they all independently stimulate hypertrophy. So it's not like this thing like, well, the concentric phase or the isometric doesn't really do much. We really, you know, growth is really eccentrically uh, sort of caused. That's not really the case. There is, is a good argument for doing all of those phases in classic conventional training. No accentuation uh, does all three of those really, really well. And for a while, uh, I would say in the late 90s, early 2000s, there are some data that showed that the eccentric phase is particularly hypertrophic. And I remember actually getting into a Facebook discussion with a gentleman who, I, you know, I made that claim and I was like, you really want to milk the eccentric? And he was like, you know, is it really true that the eccentric is uniquely hypertrophic or more hypertrophic than like concentric or isometric? And I was like, yeah, of course. And he was like, I don't think that's true. And I was like, ah, I'll show this asshole. I did a mini lit review and I was like, fuck, <laughs> he's right. <laughs> so it turns out that yes, the eccentric is a very critical part of the hypertrophic process, but it might not be so critical and so unique and so superlative by itself that we really can justify milking it at the expense of higher fatigue. So maybe cheating on the concentric to milk eccentric reps works, but the stimulus to fatigue ratio maybe isn't that good. The raw stimulus magnitude of just getting the gains, whatever the fatigue cost, is probably pretty good. But in the context of a well-structured program, you can't just always think about raw stimulus magnitude. You have to wonder at what cost of fatigue something is actually happening. So can you do these with cheat reps the, to uh, sort of slow down the eccentric and accentuate it? You can. 
I wouldn't be so excited about this as a huge net benefit. I would personally need much more compelling evidence that accentuating the eccentric is very hypertrophic or stimulative versus just doing classic conventional reps where we have an isometric phase, a concentric phase, and an eccentric phase in every single rep, and they're sort of relatively evenly prioritized, or at least concentric and eccentric are evenly prioritized. So maybe there's something there. It's just to me when people say, but what about, uh, you know, milk and eccentric? I used to be like, definitely it's worth it. But now, given the state of the literature, eh, I'm not so sure that's like the greatest idea in the world. Maybe further literature will reveal it actually is a good idea. But for now, it's not something to get so excited about that we are easily willing to pay the cost of the fatigue incurred. So to me, it's kind of like a 50-50 and maybe not the greatest idea in the world. In addition to that, cheating on the concentric and writing out the eccentric, the marginal increase in injury risk is probably legit. Nothing crazy. But, you know, is it worth the trade-off? I'm just not so sure it is. So as far as reasons to cheat, I wouldn't say it's ultra compelling. Maybe it's something to try, but I wouldn't just go running home and be like, this is it. Cheating is the greatest thing in the world. Next up is the idea of matching the force curve. People will say like, well, you know, tension grows muscles and I can't produce a ton of tension when the muscle is at its sort of fully lengthened in anatomically relevant position. I can produce a ton of tension. Like I can only lift the 40 from here to here, but I can lift the 80 from here to here. Shouldn't I get the 80s, cheat a little bit to get to this mid-range, and then pump out reps, and then put it down? Why would I do a strict only 40 because it's only 40 pounds of tension versus the 80 I could be using? Okay, seems like something to think about for sure. Excellent point that you guys brought up. However, muscle seems to grow predominantly, if not solely, when per fiber force is actually generated, not whole muscle. Each individual muscle fiber, when it's generating a lot of force, that's what stimulates that muscle fiber to grow, not the total force. So the weight of the dumbbell isn't the concern. The concern is each muscle cell, how much force is it really producing? Now, secondly, and super importantly, internally, how much muscle uh, how much force the muscle is producing is what causes growth. If we say we lift the 80 from here to here, that can be the same amount of internal muscular force as the 40 from here to here. But the only reason the 80 is liftable from here to here is just a leverage advantage. Your muscles are pulling just as hard at that stretch position. The internal force generated per fiber is ultra high with the 40 from here to here, just as high as the 80 from here to here. And here's the real kicker. Muscles seem to grow even better when they produce maximum internal per fiber force at a stretched position. Stretch plus tension seems to cause more growth than just tension without a stretch. So interestingly enough, going and using the 40-pound dumbbell all the way from a stretch, all the way either for a full range of motion or even just the bottom position, probably grows just as much muscle, at least just as much and probably more than using the 80 in the range of motion and leverage through which you can actually lift the 80. So the verdict on that is that because loaded stretch seems to grow muscle the most, and the internal load can be maximized at the stretch, you just got to pull really hard, and yet even though you can only lift a 40, the muscle is internally still producing just as much force to the tendon, and each muscle cell in there is producing just as much force as it can. Same amount of force it produces with the 80, it's just better leverage to lift the 80 than the 40 down here. And because that stretch adds a bit of hypertrophic stimulus, skipping it, and going to the, you know, cheating out of that range and getting right into the business range for the heavy weights is probably actively a bad idea. And it just seems to be another excuse to lift more weight. So if someone says, fuck, man, man, I got to cheat up to get the 80s to here. And then I do this and then I put them down. You could say, well, if you didn't cheat and you just use the 40s and you did a full range of motion or even just at the bottom, wouldn't the internal force and stretch make a, big, a bigger stimulus or at least the same stimulus without having to cheat? And the answer is fucking yes. So it seems that if we think about it, like, well, hold on a sec, my force curve is optimized here, I got to lift more weight. Yeah, external weight, that's true. But the internal load generated by the muscles is higher when they're in a disadvantaged position. Another way to think about this, and this is a cue we actually use in training sometimes, uh, Jared Feather and I, is you want to expose the musculature to the highest internal tension. You don't want to leverage the muscle to produce as much force as possible externally, because then you lift more weight, sweet, but that doesn't actually hit the muscle up as much as it could. 
For example, if you want to leverage the glutes to produce as much external force as possible, partial deadlifts are amazing because you can lift fucking like a trillion pounds. But if you do ultra deficit deadlifts, it stretches the glutes out like crazy and all of a sudden you go from deadlifting 400 for reps to deadlifting 200 for reps. But the glute musculature itself produces basically the same amount of force. It's just that the leverage sucks. The external load has to be lower. However, because it starts from a stretch position, deficit deadlifting probably is more hypertrophic for the glutes. So this argument that we have to match the force curve, it's nice if the goal is to lift as much weight as possible. And for power lifters and strength athletes, you definitely want to match force curves to get into the real life ability to lift heavy ass weight. Like if you're an arm wrestler, for example, and the business end of your range is here to here, Cheat curls are probably a fucking good idea. Cheat on the concentric, real nasty eccentric, amazing. Motherfucker, you're not an arm wrestler. You're trying to get jacked. That's why you watch this channel. If you're an arm wrestler, first of all, please don't snap my shit in half. Second of all, total fucking respect. And then cheating in a sense is sport specific. But if you're not an arm wrestler and you just want to get jacked, you don't want to have to put yourself at an extra risk of getting hurt and an extra high fatigue from having a fucking cheat curl 225 in order to get the same gains or even slightly worse gains than you could from just curling 100 and putting your muscles at a leverage disadvantage so that internal force at the stretch is what has to do all the work. So that one dies a quick death. Next one, what about a finishing move? People say, look, after my last set of strict curls, I do some cheat reps on the concentric, you know, to finish off my arms. Swell, swell idea. Not totally wrong. However, some problems are sort of questions to ask about this. First, yeah, the stimulus to fatigue ratio of cheat reps, because you have to use a ton of systemic drive, because you have to use other muscles, the stimulus to fatigue ratio kind of still might suck. All right, so that's a problem we have to deal with. And really, you could ask yourself another question and say, okay, we're finished doing our normal training. The finishing move is to kind of put like a cherry on top, an exclamation mark, to go beyond. Are there other ways to go beyond to continue to milk that close to failure zone that do not involve cheating and thus do not involve the, the really not so great SFR and slight injury risk enhancement of cheating and the other things, tracking problems, so on and so forth that we covered in the last video. Well, yeah. So for example, why not Drew, do a strict rest pause set? If you do 100 pounds for 10 in the curl, you can't do any more, you put it down. You could do three or four more reps by cheating, totally, valid. Or you could put it down for three or four seconds and then do another three or four reps, completely strict, as far as the muscles are concerned, it's really similar stimulus, but no need for cheating and all the other risks and downsides associated with it. What about a downset? You did 100 for a set of 10, you failed. Yeah, you could continue to go cheating. Or you could calmly take some weight off, leave 70 on the bar, and then do another set of like six or seven with 70. Still, again, going beyond, milking that close to failure zone, really putting the finishing touch on the muscle, but no need to cheat. So secondly, okay, fine. Rest pause is great. We have another option, a downset. So what we do there is we go to 70 pounds, 100, we stopped, go to 70, rest a normal amount of time, and then just do another set of 10 or something at 70 pounds. Again, it gets us close to failure. Again, it's a great finishing touch, no need to cheat. You could also do a drop set. And this works well if you don't have to take weights on and off the bar because drop sets are pretty fast. So if you're doing cable curls, 100 pounds, you reach close to failure on number 10, put it down, take the weight out, put it to 60 or 70, as long of a rest as that takes, do another three to four. It's that same effect at the local musculature as cheating gets us without having to cheat, without having to tax our lower back and our glutes and our systemic fatigue, et cetera, in order to get those crazy heavy reps. We just, uh, because our muscles are more tired, we just make the weight lighter and continue to push our muscles beyond and give a really great exclamation mark to that training. So the verdict here for the finishing move is that cheat reps can be fun and they can be effective, but they rarely make the most sense logically, at least in this context. Right? Now, to sort of wrap all of this up until you guys get back in the comments and maybe we'll have to make a third cheating video. So in the vast majority of cases, my thinking here is that strict lifting is, is best, right? In some unusual cases, it's just not the norm, some cheating might actually work better than totally strict stuff. It can for sure maximize raw stimulus magnitude. Like if you do a set of 10 with 100 pounds in the curl and you do some cheat reps, holy fuck, it fries you out. It's a big fatigue cost though, so the stimulus is amazing. But the fatigue could be so high that it rarely maximizes stimulus to fatigue ratio. So in the context of something you regularly do in the program, it rarely justifies its inclusion. Now, 
here's the actual last word. If cheating gives you great tension, great burn, great pump, all the indicators of a high raw stimulus magnitude, I want you to try give this a shot. Try to get the same effects from strict or lifting, at least strict or just very strict lifting, by altering technique, exercise choice, execution, downsets, drop sets, et cetera, rest, pause, blah, blah, blah. If those don't seem to give you the same thing cheating does, and cheating still gives you an amazing perception of tension, burn, pump, et cetera, more than those things do, then absolutely do it up. You have my blessing. Be as safe as you can. Cheat with as little bullshit as you can. So like in curls, don't like you'll fucking do a gymnastics flip to get the shit back up. Do a little oomph and get another rep and a little oomph, right? You don't want to be that clown at the gym that like is doing horizontal hip thrusts with a fucking bar. And someone's like, did you fail that shit 10 reps ago? What the fuck are you doing? You don't want glutes to be 90% of the force production and biceps 10%. You want glutes 10%, biceps 90. Then that's like a reasonable way to cheat if cheating is in fact the thing that is left as the most effective after you've tried to do the strict drop set, down set, Maya rep stuff, and that seems to not work as well. That being the case, after you check all the boxes and really try to get those last sort of few burn reps in a strict fashion with drop sets, down sets, et cetera, um, cheating wins that as still the most effective in probably like one out of a hundred cases. So if I walk into the gym and I watch you cheat, do cheat curls after a set of strict curls, I'm going to guess that you're being a fucking moron and you just didn't think shit through. Now, there's a chance I'm wrong. There's a chance you really thought it through and this is actually the best RSM or SFR exercise that you have available to you and that's totally cool. Just make sure that you're not using any justification you can to continue to cheat just to use more weight. I know, I've been there. Like back when I wasn't as strong as I am now, it's fucking bullshit. Like you program your curls, you're like, what the fuck, 55 pounds? This is dumb as fuck. The girl next to you is curling 65. The fuck are you supposed to ask that bitch on a date if you're weak in the hurry? You'll be like, hey, I noticed you uh, curling 65. It's kind of hot, you know. I'm kind of on my way up there myself. Maybe one day, but maybe we'll catch some coffee before then. Huh? You guys like that? Do you feel seduced? You should, that's right. I got game. In any case, the number one reason for cheating by a long shot is that people just want to use more weight. Be patient. Try to use the other techniques. You will get bigger and stronger. And then producing a stimulus is actually easy as fuck when you're super jacked because everything fucking stimulates you because you're so goddamn strong and in, in tune with your muscles. If cheating seems to be a net balance, good thing for at least raw stimulus magnitude for you, and ideally, stimulus to fatigue ratio, you have my blessing to do it. Do it intelligently. Try to track it as best as you can. But 99 times out of 100, it's still a whole bunch of bullshit. Folks, thanks for tuning in. Comment, like, subscribe, do YouTube things. See you next time.